thank you so much for your patience as we are trying to get everybody into the museum tonight. A little bit of a parking issue, but glad everybody braved the weather to uh, make it out here this evening. Uh, my name is Jeremy Michalazak, and I'm the Sybil Harrington Director and CEO here at the Phoenix Art Museum, and we are really, truly honored to have our guests here today, as well as to have many of you with us. On behalf of the museum, I am happy to welcome you to our spring 2023 lec uh, Lenhart Lecture, featuring a conversation between renowned artist Otis Kwame Chi Kweko and curator and cultural critic Larry Ose Mensa. So thank you so much for being here this evening. I also would be remiss not to welcome and recognize those with us this evening, including our members of the Board of Trustees here at the Phoenix Art Museum, as well as our Circles of Support members, and of course, museum members. Thank you so much for your support of the museum, and thank you for being here. I'd also like to, of course, welcome the artists and students who have joined us here this evening, as well as our special guests who traveled near and far to come here for the conversation tonight. We are all fortunate to have this experience as this is a series, as this series is a wonderful opportunity to hear from some of the most prolific and influential artists, of course, and curators working today. We hope tonight's conversation provides some inspiration, some hope, and some food for thought for your own creative pursuits, and as you continue to play an important role in strengthening the cultural ecosystem here in the Valley and beyond. Tonight's lecture, of course, is made possible through, of course, the generosity of the Arizona-based Lenhart family. We are deeply grateful to Don and David Lenhart, of course, with us here this evening, who in 2017 established the Lenhart Contemporary Art Initiative with the goal of deepening the museum's commitment to contemporary art. Let's give David and Don a round of applause. This initiative includes lectures such as we're experiencing here tonight. And since 2017, the Phoenix community has heard from artists such as Jim Hodges, Shara Hughes, Teresita Fernandez, Amalia Mesa Baines, Derek Forjor, and of course, most recently this past fall, <clears throat> excuse me, Rashid Johnson. In 2021, the Lenharts expanded their initiative to support the diversification of our contemporary art collection through the acquisition of works by artists contributing to the discourse on race, gender, and of course, relevant social issues and concerns. As a result, the museum has acquired works from a number of Lenhart speakers and beyond, including Otis's painting of Larry Ose Mensa, currently on view outside the auditorium. These acquisitions make an incredible impact in how the Phoenix Art Museum is taking confident steps to reimagine our holdings and representation on our walls that reflect a rapidly evolving city and region while respecting our history and strengths as an institution. As the museum looks to the future, we are committed to the big picture view for the Phoenix Art Museum, where engagement, innovation, and representation are at the forefront of what we do and ensures the greatest impact and support to our community. And thanks to the generosity of the Lenharts and the privilege of having our special guests here with us this evening, we are on our way to putting actions to words and ideas to opportunities. So thank you for that. <clears throat> And now I have the privilege to introduce tonight's speakers and guests. Otis Chi Kwame Kweko was born in Accra, Ghana. Today, he is one of the leading West African artists of his generation with a degree in painting from Ganada College of Art and Design. Otis approaches painting as an exploratory medium that allows us to engage with topics of personal identity, social dynamics, and the history of painting itself. His richly textured portraits are intimate and powerful, and his bold use of concentrated fields of color capture the emotions and defining characteristics of his sitters. His recent series of portraits featuring black cowboys modernized the genre, discontinuing a widespread, inaccurate, and exclusionary account of history. Joining Otis tonight in conversation is curator and cultural critic Larry Ose Mensa. Larry is a native of the Bronx and he uses art as a forum to redefine how we see ourselves and of course the world around us. Larry currently serves as curator at large at the Brooklyn Academy of Music and formerly served as senior curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit. 
We are very excited to have both Otis and Larry here with us this evening, and of course, look forward to hearing the insights on the process of portraiture and the give and take between artist and subject, among many other topics. We were also very fortunate with their time, and it was a privilege for a lot of the artists here to have the experience to really engage with Larry and Otis while here in the Valley, and it is absolutely and incredibly honored to introduce, of course, Otis and Larry to the stage. So let's give them a warm welcome. Um, thank you, uh, David, Don, Jeremy, the team here at the museum. Uh, as many of you may or may not know, I, I travel a lot to different cities. And sometimes you go to a city and you, and you feel at home. Sometimes you don't. And I'm happy to say uh, I feel really at home here at Phoenix. And, and, um, and, and I was joking with Otis and I'm, I'm already plotting our return. So this, this hopefully will be the first of many conversations and engagements with the community. Thank you to all the artists that have allowed this opportunity to spend time with them in their studios yesterday and today. Um, so Otis, this will be a casual conversation just to set the stage. We'll chat for about 45 minutes and then we'll open it up to questions. So if you have questions at the end of this conversation, we definitely want to hear from you. You know, impressions about what we're talking about, impressions about the painting. Um, a lot of people have been asking me, how do you feel seeing your portrait? Um, it's a little bit strange, but I've also, you know, create a distance from it, right? So just for people who want to know how that portrait came to be, um, we did that, what, 2021? So 2021, I went out to Portland just to visit Otis and just check on him. And I thought we were just gonna hang out, you know, eat the delicious food in Portland. And like, we're in the studio and he's like, oh, put this jacket on. I'm like, okay. You know, he's like, and what about this hat? <laughs> and then next thing you know, I'm part of a series of photos that have become paintings. One of the first paintings was in the exhibition uh, last spring in Brussels, which is that larger uh, image which you'll see with me with the uh, scarf on. And then this is another image, um, which is the first that I've seen Otis working on panel. And so I think what's really great, and I was talking to someone earlier is that much much of Otis's paintings invite looking, but this really invites looking because the texture, you know, that, you know, he's become synonymous with, you really kind of got to get close to kind of see and observe and feel the vibrance and the movement. Um, but Otis, my, my first question, because I know they want to know, how, how has your experience been in Phoenix? What, what's your impressions? You know, we're in the Southwest, and I was, I was saying earlier, I'm like, where are the Cowboys? <laughs> I don't see them. Uh, but, you know, tell us about your impressions about you know, the time so far. Yeah, first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody for being here. You could be somewhere else, but you chose to be here. So I really appreciate that. And um, also, thank you to all the wonderful artists that we visited at the studio. You guys are amazing. You are doing great stuff. It was a, um, a great opportunity to meet all of you and you know talk to us about your practice and all of that. And also, a very big thank you to David and um, the staff of the museum. They've been wonderful since we came. And, and it's a great opportunity to be here and to talk to you wonderful people. Um, my experience so far in Phoenix has been nice, especially the weather, because it's been, yeah, it's been raining and um, snowing a lot in Portland, so it was nice to kind of like get out of that and then be in this um, environment. And um, it's been an amazing journey. Um, my wife's family is here, and they take us around. We see a lot of stuff, so beautiful landscape anyway. And um, like Larry said, we are even thinking of getting a condo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, who knows? Because this is not Florida. Yeah. 
It's a running joke that I have with David. But yeah, it's been an amazing um, time here so far. And um, um, my expectation, like again, Larry was saying, I thought once we landed at the airport, I would see the cowboys just riding their horses around. And, uh, you know, but but we've seen amazing things so far and we are enjoying it so far. Yeah. So let's let's go back because I don't want to assume that everybody knows the scope of your practice. But can you talk to us about how art came to you in your life, early in your life? Because you talk about this urge, you know, to draw, to doodle, to express yourself. So talk to us about those kind of gestation periods and then how does that evolve into you, you know, going on the journey to professionalize your passion for, for art? I, I would say I, I stumbled on art by accident or out of curiosity, if I'll put it. Um, back then, we used to watch movies a lot, go to the movie theaters and all that. And um, um, that is in Ghana. And most of these movie theaters have um, commissioned posters for the movies that we did on the theater. So these giant posters will be outside of the theaters. And I've been to the movies so many times, but I never realized those were hand-painted you know, posters until one day I got closer. I'm like, oh, it's something weird about this poster. So me being curious, started touching it and then realized this is a painting and not actually something that was like printed. So I started asking around and to find out who are these guys that did uh, these paintings. And I finally got to know where these paintings have been done for the posters. And I was just intrigued on how realistic it was and how even how deceiving it was for me not knowing this is a painting. So since then, I just, uh, out of curiosity, always go to their space and try to find out how they do these posters. And one day I'm like, I want to learn this. And then they took me in. So gradually, it became a hobby. And then the love started growing and growing and growing. But uh, it, it was just the love and then the curiosity out of it that really, really dragged me into it. And then I never considered it um, to be like a, a real job or me, myself, as an artist, because I wanted to be a soccer player growing up. So. <laughs> Um, um, the drawing part was something that I was just intriguing to me and to see if I can draw or see if I can produce what they are doing. And then it just went on and on and on and on. And later part in life where I found out there's a whole institution for it, which was the Ganata College of Art and Design. And from there, I like, I want to go there and then check it out. So when I went there and I saw all these students and colors everywhere, it's just like blew my mind. And there was this urge and love in it that kept me drawing to that. So I applied for it and then um, it started from there, just you know, exploring with color and trying to understand the color and all of that. It just grew from there. And some of you may or may not have heard about Ganada. Ganada no longer is in existence, um, but can you, Talk about the impact of that experience because Otis was classmates with Amako Boafo, Kwesi Bwachwe, uh, 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 Cornelius Anor, a lot of you know the figurative painters that you're seeing coming out of Ghana. Most of them went to this school. I, I jokingly call them the Ganata Mafia um, <laughs> because it's kind of unusual that you just see... Uh, an institution produced so many artists, and this is an institution that's now defunct, you know, almost a decade now. Um, but it was also a practice-based program. And so it was really more about, you know, perfecting your craft, exactly. you know. So can you talk a little bit about that experience and what from that experience do you, uh, stays with you now, even when you're in your studio making work? Oh, a lot of it. Um, Ganata was an institution that gave opportunity to um, everybody. It doesn't matter your educational background. It was more of like a, a place where you can learn craft. Where the, 
be it carpentry, whatever. It's just a space where you go to learn something for yourself, a skill for yourself. So it, 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 they also gave us the free will to explore with college, just the freedom of you exploring and finding yourself as an artist or what you are good at. So uh, um, through Ganata, I learned the basic of using color and how to use the color to express yourself and um, um, how to really explore with it and also find yourself as an artist. So it, it has... That part has always been with me, even till this day. Uh, some of the basics that we learned right from the beginning, we still apply it currently to my works and all of that. So it, it, it has really impacted me because that is where I got to learn a lot of um, um, stuff during my early stages of um, you know, trying to uh, professionalize my career, if I can say. So it, it is still with me, some of the basic things they, they taught us back in school, yeah. And now um, you came here from Ghana to Portland, Oregon, sunny Portland, Oregon. <laughs> um, and for more background, so Otis and I met four or five years ago, I don't even remember, um, in LA. Late 2019, LA something like that. Yeah. So him and the Marco Buffo were doing a residency with Danny First in LA. Um, Otis, you know, had his section of the studio where he was painting. And, um, you know, I was always curious, like how did he end up in Portland of all places and not <laughs> New York? But what was, what has the shift been going from Ghana to the United States? Could we talk to a number of artists um, who've migrated here from different parts of the world and have landed here in Phoenix? What, what's that shift been like for you to kind of find some footing, build community, build some normalcy? You have a family, you're here, you're here there with your wife. Um, how has that affected you, know, you as a person, but then also your approach to your practice? Um, surprisingly, first of all, I didn't like USA at all. <laughs> yeah. My my mom and dad watch a lot of CNN and you know, all those things that happened. So it made me not like anything about USA. And also because back in school, most of our um, history lessons and arts was, you know, mainly about Europe and the beginning of all of that. So the interest was to go to Europe and then learn more about art and all that. But love always gets us. <laughs> my wife, <laughs> I met my wife on um, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and her love for photography and all of that. We, we have this um, art festival that we annually have in Ghana. And she has always wanted to come visit. And finally, she got the opportunity to come and visit and all of that. And while she was there, you know, all that love thing clicked. And then fast forward, <laughs> I have to move to the state and we got married. And so, yeah, that is how I found myself in Oregon. I know a lot of people, that's the first question they ask me, why Oregon? So I say, ask my wife. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so laughs> So yeah, but it, it's, it's, it's been an amazing journey because that also being here in the state also um, um, opened, gave me an open-minded, you know, the experience being here as an African-American and all those um, things that goes around me, my community and all of that also influences um, my work. And, and it just, the art market here in general just opened up a whole lot of ideas and not sticking to what I know back in Ghana. So that gave me the opportunity to also explore different, um, you know, topics and issues and events that are going on. So it has, it has really um, played a major role in, in, in my work, in my practice. It's getting specific into the, the practice. So there was a moment where you were exploring abstraction yeah. in your practice. Can you talk a little bit about the role of abstraction, the freedom it gave you, and then the inclusion of the figure and the kind of like, because I think when you look at, like this is a great example, the texture that you get in the background, I think some of that is still kind of very present, but then you've now been able to kind of fuse both approaches. So you, can you talk about 
you know, exploring abstraction as a strategy and then blending that in with the figures um, to now kind of uh, 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 be present in the practice that you, you now are working through? When, when I started at college, um, my, one of my majors was in abstract because um, I, I didn't know how to express myself vocally, so color was a way of me expressing myself. And I like the idea that it's, it's almost like there's no rule to it. You just have to go with the flow and how you feel and emotion. So I, I dealt into that and then use that as a way of me expressing myself. But uh, on the way towards graduation, where, like I said earlier on, where the world was beginning to enter into the digital world and all of that, I decided to learn photography, even though I had passion for it for length that I decided to um, uh, learn photography. And by doing so, my interest became more of like photographing people and then once I go back home and start looking at these images on the camera, I, I felt more connected to the people. So that was the difference between the abstraction and then the portraiture. I felt more connected because you get to deal with people and their emotions and these are real people that you can actually um, um, do something with it. So in, in my practice, I use the photography at the same time, my background of um, um, abstract as a way of like communicating and also depicting the person's character and using the, uh, the colors to um, explore the person's emotion and also talk about the person, yeah. And with these portraits, uh, with these paintings, who are these people? Are these strangers? Are they friends? Are they... You know, some people find images on the internet. Like, what's the process to kind of like identify an individual and say, okay, I'm going to make a painting of this person? I mean, even like, we can talk about the painting outside. Like, why make a painting of me? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like how do you decide? Because I'm always curious, you know, because I have other friends who like are painters and I'm like, always dressing up when they're having an event. <laughs> like Henry Taylor's a friend and it's like, you know, it took maybe a good 10 years before Henry made even a drawing of me. So I'm always curious how artists decide that, okay, I want to capture the essence of this person. Yeah. So I guess, who are these people to you? And then how do you decide I'm going to make a portrait of this person? Yeah, when, when I moved here to USA um, and then my experience with what is going on and, you know, racism and all of that, I, I thought of how do I incorporate this in my work? So first, I started using the images that I find online, but after working on these images, there wasn't any kind of connection to it because I didn't know these people, so I didn't know how to express myself or tell their stories. So then the idea was to try to find models or people that are, will sit for me. But it was also hard for me to do and difficult because I don't know how to approach people and be like, hey, would you like to sit for me? <laughs> and once you gather the courage to approach people, then they look at you all weirdly because they don't know you well for them to be vulnerable to you. So then the idea was to use my own friends and people that I know well to, to express this feeling and talk about these um, issues and all that. So it start, that is how it started me using my friends to talk about um, whatever issue or whatever subject or whatever thing that I want to talk about and one of them is you of course and the reason why I chose you because the past years um, um, I've got to know you I've also been following your your project and stuff you've been doing a lot, uh, online and for me you've been one of the voices in the art industry and also for the artists as well because uh, when I started um, when we met in LA I was wondering who you were because Amwaku was talking to you a lot. And that was actually Amwaku's residency. So I was just kind of like tagging along. Yeah. And then um, I hear you talk to him and advice and like ideas and all of that. And that's how I became friends and like following you around. So I thought um, you, you 
you will be a good subject or be um, somebody that can use to talk about a certain group of people because of the kind of voice you have in the, you know, in the industry and then like for we artists as well so that's the main reason why I decided to use you and not just because of that but also for the Cowboy series because you for me you represent a certain group of people that need to be uh, um, spoken of and that's why I chose you I appreciate so that. it's been an honor thank, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Um, we'll get to the Cowboy series um, in a bit, but can we talk about some of the other series? So you have, um, which will come up, this twin series yeah. that you did, where you did these portraits of twins. Can you talk about why you did that series, what twins signify in Ghanaian culture? Because mm. I think if without context, you're just kind of looking at like, okay, is it the same person, two different people? Like, what's happening here? Yeah, that twins series came about when, um, you know, I started seeing twins around here in the state. But it, it, it almost feels like they don't even realize they are twins, <laughs> you know? Because, you no, know, in Ghana, when you are a twin, we see it to be like something out of this world. And people, families or other families would like to come to visit the home or the parents and like touch the children, believing they will also have twins. Because um, 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 we think they bring good luck. In other tribes, they think it's bad luck. So depending on the tribe, and we celebrate twins every year and there's a whole festival. Twins wear the same clothes, got the, you carry some sort of pride. So me not seeing it here, it was weird to me. So I took it upon myself to kind of like bring our culture here so that people can also um, experience and know how we treat our twins back home and in the different. So once I get to approach some of the twins that live here and I tell them, I'm there, they look at me all weird like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, so I show them videos of the festivals and now they wish to be in Ghana to be celebrated like that. <laughs> so. It, it, it becomes like sharing information. I take um, what I learned here back home, and then back home I bring some information here. So it, it, it's just a way of like sharing information and you know also loving yourself, you know, just to put it out there. Yeah. And my dad is also a twin, so. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, my dad is. This is another one. So this painting is probably the size of the projector. It's a big painting. Um, it was in part of an exhibition that was at uh, Almin in Brussels yeah, last year. Brussels. Um, and you'll see some paintings of the twins coming up. And so now, you know, you have this Black Cowboy series that started, I think, late 2019? Yeah, late 2019. So talk to us about the cowboy. Like, how did you come to learn about cowboys, become fascinated by it, and then wanted to use your practice as a forum to uh, amplify, you know, kind of the omissions mm -hmm. of the stories of black cowboys. You know, you talked about the Compton Cowboys, you have cowboy culture in uh, Philadelphia, New Orleans, urban cowboys. So can you talk, like, where did this fascination come from? Well, it started from movies, Western movies. I don't know. Um, it's what we call TNT movies. I don't know if you, yeah. Yeah, I watched a lot of that growing up. And after the movies, I always come up and I was just intrigued about the accent and how they dress and how they pull the gun on the side, <laughs> you know. So um, I watched a lot of those movies, but um, again, after all of that, I asked, I started questioning myself, why is it that there is nobody in that movie that looked like me, you know? So the idea of creating a fictional character in my head, that's how it started, because there is no way in my mind that I knew such um, uh, African-American cowboys existed or there is any history behind that. All that I saw was a movie. So it was just building this character in my head and I never thought of it, this was way back. And moving to the state again, um, 
when I first had opportunity to um, do the residency in LA, um, everything came back again. So I tried to bring this fictional character into vision. And that is why I painted the first ever cowboy that I did. And it was just to get it out of my head because I've had it for a long time. So um, my first gallery, Robert's Project, and then the owner of the residency came in and they saw it and was like, what is this? And I was like, it's a portrait of cowboy. That's all it is. But they were intrigued by it and then they were starting to ask me a bunch of questions. You know? So I was just surprised because it's, this is just something that I was getting out there. And then they told me to explore more on that and uh, just try to get more information about that. So I just took it upon myself to find more information and see what's going on here. Why are they so uh, like into this and all of that? And then it was during that period when um, the murder of George Floyd happened and then uh, I saw the Compton Cowboys and that just took me in a whole journey in another level. So I started researching on that and I found out that there's a whole community or history about that. So that is actually where it started for me to explore more on the Black Cowboys and all of that. And that is how the series started. So it, 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 it has since then been a, learn, a learning process for me because I still... Um, finding out more information and history about that and that so it's always putting the pieces together to you know uh, come out of this what's been kind of the most interesting thing you've learned so these are some of the first ones mm -hmm. um, in the series and I remember when he posted it on Instagram I was like what the hell is that yeah. you know because if you see that in relationship to the other kind of more normal portraits this is like a quantum leap and so i guess you know what what surprised you in 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 the process of like doing the research making the paintings inviting people to come to the studio we talked a lot about not only the cowboys but the cow girls cow women in the culture so what surprised you through the process of like beginning First of to all, build the out the big series? surprise is knowing that the existence of the black and, and African-American cowboys, that alone was a surprise to me. But also, apart from that, um, the journey in um, um, some of the states that the, you later find out that uh, African American cowboys actually existed was surprising, it's a, it's a, especially with Portland. I also recently found out there's a whole community of um, um, African American cowboys, and there is a black rodeo that goes on that I never thought existed, and all that. So there is always something new that I learn, and um, I didn't get access to these people, the real cowboys. So that is how also I started using friends that I know to tell these stories because I also use them just to normalize the imagery when we talk about cowboys and of course way back then and since then, a lot of people thought just um, whites are, are meant to be cowboys. So I, it's part of it and using uh, my friends is just to normalize the imagery when you, when you talk about cowboys and in the Western kind of like, yeah. And besides normalization, you know, because we were talking earlier about, you know, indigenous cowboys, um, yeah. Chicano cowboys, um, why is it important that you mine history and bring it into the contemporary moment to kind of have this conversation through, through your practice? It is important because, um, again, when I started visiting museums, all that I see, and never again, I never saw anybody like me in a painting. And whenever I do, they are in the background or like almost kind of disappearing into uh, the painting. So uh, um, actually when I got to Portland, um, the first black artist painting that I saw was Kehinde. Kehinde, while well, I remember my wife took me and I'm like, what is this? What is it? <laughs> because it's the first ever painting that I've seen a black person like being the main fourth and just the figure alone. So that just blew my mind. So it has always been um, one of my goal and tax to, again, say normalize this. And, and for me, it's a way of... Um, documenting um, um, what is going on now, but at the same time, it's like putting it down for 
for the pre- uh, the future. Again, when the twelve year old myself in fifty years or something walks into a museum, it becomes something that is okay to see. You know, it's not like they, uh, now where you go where everything is just changing now. So, it, it the main thing is just to normalize it and not make it. Um, um, how people say like oh this is surprising it's just to know that when you walk in this is what you see now I know we got a number of artists in the studio so this is where we nerd out um, can you talk a little bit about the process of making a painting for you like you going into the studio you got a blank canvas you know we talked about you know it's almost like Jay-Z and Biggie, you, you got 10 paintings in your head, and you're trying to figure out, okay, which one's gonna be manifested on the canvas. What, take us through, without giving us a secret, secret sauce, but take us through the process. You know, is it start with a sketch? Are you using multiple reference images? Are you listening to music? Like, do you have to go into a trance? Like, what, what, what what's happening in the studio to produce these, these beautiful works of art? Well, it starts with coffee or tea. <laughs> yeah. So I have to get that first. And then most of the time, in wherever I find myself, I'm always kind of like looking around just to look at people's reaction and how someone looks. It's just constant how the brain is working. So I might be talking to you or talking with you, but I'm actually looking at certain things and how your lips move, how your body, and then the reflection of the light and like how it falls on the skin, how it renders the skin. So once I, it's always an instinct when I see my mom, it's like somebody that I want to, it's always an instinct. So once I get that, I talk to you and get to know more about you and then invite you to the studio. So I like to take the pictures myself because I don't, I don't like using life model or painting life because then when the person sits too long, the, he or she loses its essence and like the vibe. It's, I, I always like to capture the moment and then once you capture it, I feel you just capture the person's character and everything. So I work from my, um, the pictures that I take myself and... I always sketch them, then just go from there. But music always does the thing for me, and it helps me with the lines that I throw in the painting, and I constantly change music. And when I'm moving to the next part of the body, it always have to be, um, I have to be in certain mood. And I always start with the eyes because that's where mostly my focus is. And so when I start with the eyes, it's kind of like being in a small, subtle mood and just focus. And then once I start to get in the body, I go heavy. Yeah. So then it's eyes, then skin? The eyes, the skin, and then the body. The background is always afterthought. I never think about the background. It always have to come to me. And when it doesn't, I leave it plain. Can you talk about, because particularly with this painting, you know, as I mentioned before, it's the first one that I've seen on panel. And so the way you're rendering skin is a little bit different in terms of how the brush is moving. Mm. So can you talk about like how you've landed on this particular tone, this skin tone mm. um, for your figures? Um, and the difference between working on panel versus yeah. canvas, just so people can kind of get um, like an understanding. Yeah. I, I used to paint in full color mood. Um, so what? Paint in full color. Okay. Just a full color. But again, I, the love for black and white photography just um, hit me in a different way because I felt black and white photography for me signifies, it just brings out the history. There's some mystery about it, just the absence of color and just the rawness of it. Uh, that that is what actually um, drew my attention of using the skin and also me being a black person being in the state and how people are just uh, just because of your skin tone you know uh, it also um, um, has a connection to how you are being treated so it was just an interesting thing to me and me living in a country where everybody is black and I never get to think about my skin tone 
until I moved to the state and see, okay, how black I am. <laughs> so, so it was kind of like using that in my work to talk about, you know, my journey in life and me being in the state and all of that. And that's how come um, I started like taking out all the colors and see how far I can go with, um, uh, with just black and white and then making everything else colorful by just trying to connect the two and then also it, it signifies the world that I'm in, where I come from, and then me being in the state as well. Yeah, and that's how come I, I, I landed on the, um, the skin tone. And then Texture keeps, kept coming up tonight and talking to people, and you revealed something earlier that I wasn't aware about. Um, can you talk about the strategy around some of the Texture background? Because you had mentioned that for you, it was kind of reminiscent of the architecture yeah. from the north in Ghana. Yeah. And so for those who are not familiar with the north, the north is you know pretty much Sahara, I guess. Yeah. Or Sahel. So it's, um, I guess, drier, similar oh, to like drier. Arizona. Similar to Phoenix. So a lot of um, drier. structures made from mud. From mud, yeah. Um, so can you talk about, because I, I never made that correlation in terms of like, you pulling from the aesthetics of that architecture and then embedding that into this, into this. Into even the even in the cities, when um, the buildings are being constructed, you know, the first cement they applied on the wall, they throw the cement, it creates this sort of like a wavy texture. So I always see them working and it's just like, just a, sometimes you are not aware of it, but in your mind, it's just kind of like in your consciousness, keeping that record in your head. And later on, when you're working, it starts to come like, how do I apply this to the work? And again, making reference to um, the buildings in the northern regions where there's um, these villages, the women, most, mostly the women that build the houses. And um, that's the texture and the process they make it. I just try to see how I can apply them in, in my painting and also the idea of having something to look at and then play and then wrap your mind around it. And um, that's, that's just the reason. And then my love for sculpture, just the idea of having sort of like a three-dimensional thing to touch. Yeah. And then I want to talk about composition. Like I look at a painting like this, we have a young boy on a horse, gaze is looking beyond the viewer, you know, just kind of in control. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about how are you making decisions around composition for each painting, particularly if you're like taking multiple images that you're using for references? Yeah. One, composition, but then also like, what are you aiming to evoke when someone looks at a painting, right? Particularly with this cowboy series where, you know, which is interesting like this one where like the gaze is direct, it's 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 stern, it's confident. What is it that you want people to kind of meditate on when they see, you know, a painting like this or some some work from the cowboy series? Usually the most that I go for is the connection. I try as much as possible to find connection. I just want the viewer to make a connection with the painting, even though you don't know who the person is. It's just uh, to sort of like have a moment with the painting. So I mostly go for that. Depending, it doesn't matter which what, what series that I'm I'm painting. It's just the connection that I want people to have, because that is what I had that made me choose such character for that. So, it, it, because for me it's personal because I, I'm telling their story, but also telling a little bit of my story to it. So it's just a moment where I want the viewer to have that connection. That is why my focus is mostly, um, I start mostly with the eyes, because that's surprisingly, you see a huge painting, but most time is spent on the eyes than the rest of the painting, because I'm, it, it, I want to capture that emotion and that feeling for somebody to also sort of like, um, feel what I felt when I was painting or going through the process of the painting. So it, it, my aim mostly is just a connection between humanity and just have the feeling without you even actually meeting the person. And you also often talk about making the paintings for yourself as a way to kind of have this like, 
uh, self-referential conversation. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about you know, like when you're in the studio and you're making something to satisfy a need or answer a question or get out some uh, uh, emotion or mm. frustration? Yeah. Joy? Um, it's, um, it's just telling a little bit of story by myself and my experiences living here and back home. Um, most of the time when I go to New York and I take Uber or Lyft or taxi, and then most of the drivers are fellow Africans that are like, you know, also living in the state. And once they get to know you're also from Africa, they start this conversation. And when you listen to them, it's like they've been wanting to find somebody that sort of like come from the same background and like tell their story. And they are so emotional when they are talking about this story because you can feel the pain. So when you have such moments, this is what you're taking. And then you listen to such story from some people, you invite them to the studio, you put yourself in the... Uh, um, um, situation or in their stories and because it's kind of like a similar story so when you are sharing that you put a little bit of yourself also in it because it's the same um, almost the same kind of um, situation that we go through so that's how come I find myself um, um, also being part of what I create because it's a way of also um, um, talking about myself and that's the moments that I'm mostly vulnerable. Aside that, when it's gone, I put on the hard face. <laughs> yeah. um, besides your passion for creating, what's keeping you motivated and challenged in the studio? Because right now, there's so much attention on black artists, particularly artists working in figuration, and it's very easy to be distracted by uh, the murmurs of the market and make something to kind of satisfy mm. that beast. So how do you not get caught in that trick bag and continue to challenge and push yourself, you know, whatever that may look like for you? In the studio, I mean, right from the beginning when I started at college, it has always been. I mean, the history books that we have in school is so always you hear Da Vinci, Picasso, and me and my colleagues and working the race. It has always been our aim to be to replace that with our names in the books. Mm -hmm. So it's like we never had a role model we can pick in Ghana and say, "Oh yeah, we want to be like that." So it became. Um, a challenge among ourselves to challenge ourselves so that we can replace that so that in the next generation that to come to the school when they are reading about that our names will be mentioned and that's one of the masters or you know so each time I'm in the studio that is what keeps coming back and back and back like you have this that you want to achieve and uh, so I block all of that noise that goes on and um like I always tell people, I, I always consider myself as an emerging artist and a local artist because um, there is so much to learn and the journey is way, way ahead of me. And all this that I'm creating is part of the process that will lead me to where I want to get. And how does it feel to have, you know, one of your works now part of the permanent collection of this prestigious museum? It is weird. <laughs> no, I mean, it is weird in a sense when, when, like I said, when I got to the Portland Art Museum and I saw Kehinde, I was just blown away. And my wife kept saying, who knows, maybe one day your work will be in this museum. I'm like, nah, no way. Like, you have to be in the top way to be in museum. That was the perception, you know. And a few years back, the Portland Art Museum came and said, we want to have your work at the museum. So it was, it, it becomes like a dream. And once we walk in the building and I see the painting there, like your portrait, it still doesn't sound real to me. And, and it's just, sometimes I ask myself, why are all these people here to listen to me talking? <laughs> you know? Because I, I, like I said, I don't, when I'm working, I, I don't consider myself like I've, I'm there 
for me, I still see myself like I'm still working. I still see myself like um, an artist that has not been discovered yet. So that pushes me a lot to to be where I want to be. Until I get there, I'm still an emerging artist. But what what is where is there? Is there there or is it more just a concept? Because <laughs> I know for me there 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 is no there. You know, which is kind of the fun part. I think, you know, there is kind of like a great concept to keep the chip on your shoulder. Mm. But is there a there for you? Or is it like, is I it to be in all the major museums around the world? Like, what would be a North Star if there was one? I think there for me, I think an example like the musician Bob Marley. He's no more but when you listen to his music, it feels like he's still there. That for me is there. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good point to stop and we want to open it up to any questions. Um, Oops, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> Special shout out to this, this woman right here. Oh yeah, Ramirez, Christian. <laughs> and congratulations to our artist. Thank you. Uh, beautiful presentation. I'm Jeannie Winograd, and I was working for a website about 25 years ago and met people from uh, America's Buffalo Soldiers. Have you in, uh, met them yet? No, I haven't. They were a Civil War unit, and my husband and I got to ride with them. <laughs> so I encourage you to try to meet them because they have a fascinating history, and I think you might enjoy meeting some of them. Thank oh, then I think we have to meet after this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, Larry, thank you for all the wonderful questions. Um, and Otis, you got me over here crying a little bit. Um, I'm so encouraged by the things that you shared. Um, as an artist, we have this journey that we go through. And I think there are specific pieces that we have that hold um, pretty heavy emotional significance for us. Is there a piece in particular for you that was like life changing that like you still think about to this day that it was like your pivotal moment in your career and in your life? Good question. Oh yeah, I, and it's in um, LA right now. And anytime I visit the collector's home, I'm like, I'm gonna come back in the middle of the night and pull that off the wall. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's that way because you described the painting it, it was one of the first cowboys okay and I think because it was the beginning of everything for me there was a lot of like hard work and not to say that I don't put hard work in the recent works but you you are in a different you know emotional state when you're doing that because I, it, for me, it was just creating something that it has always been in me that I wanted to let it out. So I put everything in it. And then once it came out, the people around me saw that. And that is what made everything just took off. Mm -hmm. And I had to let go because at that time, I've also not learned too much about the art world and how to keep certain artworks for yourself. So it's, it's one of the pieces that each time I go to his house, I'm, I keep looking at him like, <laughs> I'll come back for this. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, I was interested in regards to when you start painted, the type of mediums that you chose. And I noticed that on the painting outside, it seemed to be painted on wood. Have you noticed that you have wanted to change mediums or how you paint and the colors that you choose have changed since you've come to America? Um, yeah, because back in Ghana, you, you are limited to the materials you have. And then when I got here and I first walked into Blake Art Materials, it was like heaven. 
I wanted to walk out with everything that I saw there. So the 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 resource alone gives you a lot of opportunity to explore with different materials. And since then, I've been exploring with different different with different materials and adding all sort of things that I find. So yeah, it has changed significantly, and um, the topics and the idea of um, tackling other issues also have changed a lot. Because um, here you are open to all sort of ideas and the involvement of you yourself because of the experience you have as a different person living in the state gives you a whole idea and yeah, the opportunity to explore other things as well. Yeah, uh, it depends on the character of the person. And sometimes too, I'm not aware that I have repeated certain colors. And I think it's because most of the time, it's also the emotions, the uh, moment that I'm in, uh, it depends on, on that as well. And then when I'm done, that is where I become aware of like, oh, I have this color again. But when working, sometimes you are in certain, you know, motions that you don't even realize what you're doing. It's like you've been taken by the moment and you're just working and working. And when you're done, you sit back and like, oh, this is how it came out. And most of the time, how you've imagined it, it's not all the time how the finished work will be. So I allow myself to be carried away. I don't, I don't usually like to think about it too much. I used to, and I realized when I think about it too much, it, it, I don't connect with it. So I decided to let go and just get in the studio and just do. So most of my paintings, I don't even have title for it. They come later on when I'm done with the whole thing. The idea is there for the series, but the titles are not there until the paintings are done because I, I like to go in, put on the music, and then let's see what we have today. Let it go soon. Okay. Otis, your your work is beautiful. Thank you. Very personal. Uh, you want to touch it, right? But oh, yeah. I know you can. <laughs> um, my question is this: Do you ever do like uh, your your paintings are social statements in themselves, right? Uh, in a ver on a very personal basis, but. Uh, from the climate in this country, uh, do they ever get? Do you ever get political or social commentary on a on a on a larger scale, like like pointing a finger more more? I mean, sometimes I just like to leave that to the viewers. However, you make out of that painting, you know, it's just leaving that conversation among whoever is filming the painting because most of the time, like they say, um, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. So maybe I might be creating for something else, but you view it as a different. So sometimes it's, it's tricky with that. And even when I'm being specific, some people might not get it that way. So it's it's that is why most of the time I say I paint for myself first before the viewer. So when I go in there, whatever I work on, it's personal to me. And then when I get it out there, however you make it, because the way you view it, someone else might view it. Um, we have an artwork here by Raymond Saunders. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Mm -hmm. An African-American artist from uh, Pittsburgh, my home. And um, he wrote an essay saying black is a color because he didn't like it when people referred to him as a black artist and his art as black art. And I was just wondering, you were making mentioning the burgeoning market for black art. I just wondered, what your thoughts were about the idea of black art and I don't know. I just thought his essay was very interesting and I was just wondering if you, either of you have any thoughts on, his essay was black as a color. You know, right? It's not a kind of art, it's black. I mean, I, I sometimes don't like saying that, that black art or black artists, but you can also ignore the fact that this is also, you know, going on and it's important for us to identify that way. So you, you as much as you, you don't like to say, you have to say, it. because um, um, that is what we identify ourselves and we are proud of that. Or someone will say it for you. Yeah. And I, and I think black is nuanced. Like I just curated an exhibition in Manila. First exhibition in Southeast Asia of all black artists. And I had to make that make sense for myself. 
-hmm. and then make that make sense for the audience, right? And help them understand that, you know, you know. Black folks are not a monolith, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, I had to be intentional with, you know, making sure that there was the right balance of figurative work, abstract work, sculpture, collage, um, you know, we have Avon Span working there. That's on terry cloth. Alterance Gumby's working with glass. Spencer Lewis is working on burlap. Uh, Shabalala Self was working with fabric. And so for me, you know, it's, it's, I get what Raymond is saying in that, you know, it's not a monolith, it's not a very specific thing. Mm -hmm. It's breadth and depth, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm always thinking about it from the lens of, Diaspora, right? Because I'm always learning, you know, even though I, both of my parents are Ghanaian, I grew up here. And, you know, every Christmas we go, we meet up. We, I remember distinctly we went to, uh, what was Artist Alliance? Yeah. Uh, which is a, you know, historical kind of art space in Ghana. And we're looking at Ghanaian master artists. I don't know who any of these dudes are. And Otis is looking at me like, you don't know who this is? You don't know who that is? And so I think, you know, for me, I look at it as layered. I look at it as complicated, messy, beautiful, painful, joyful. I mean, I think all those, you know, adjectives is what makes the black experience so unique um, and so, you know, intriguing to me. Um, and I think intriguing to a lot of folks. It must have been a big pressure doing that show in Southeast Asia going, I ha this may be all they see of black art. I have to have it all there, kind of, sort of. Well, so no, because I approached it knowing that I, I can't do that. Okay. You know, that I, it's not going to be encyclopedic. So even in the language, I say it's an ensemble, right? So when you think about like a musical ensemble, whether it's vocal or symphony, you got people playing the clarinet, violin, percussion, um, strings, and they all come together to make this sound, right? And so that's what I think about when I think about the black diaspora that like, you know, you have people who are going to be great at portraiture, sculpture, photography, and this is artists in general, right? And so for me, I, I, I was conscious that I'm not creating the definitive exhibition. This is just a snapshot and an offering, and then hopefully other people will come and build whether they agree or they're like, oh, this is not it. But it starts a conversation, you know, and I think... I was talking to some artists the other day, like, when it comes to me doing this work, you know, I was, I was telling, uh, I was talking to you, <laughs> um, it's a blessing to do this work. You know, this is fun, right? And so I don't ever look at it as pressure, right? Because I know that, like, there will never be one definitive show that can articulate the nuance of the black experience. And this is only like, you know, one one kind of a penny in, in the well, right? But hopefully over time, there's accumulation and other people can bring different perspectives and points of view um, to kind of have a more kind of expanded dialogue. So I was actually excited and I was really, uh, intrigued by the feedback and what people were seeing and reading because um, they were seeing things I didn't even think about, you know, so yeah. So this will be the um, last question. We have yeah. only time for one more. Oh, okay. Dang, okay. Well, I was going to try to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was going to try to. <laughs> we just getting warmed up. <laughs> I was going to try to, but I'll pick one. Okay. So how do you determine when a painting is done, when you're wanting to or willing to let it go? And what emotions do you have when you walk by some of your older paintings and like, oh, I wish I'd done this or I'm very happy that way. So what goes through your mind of I'm now ready to release this to the world to see? Hmm. <laughs> um, I think as an artist, you know when a painting is done. It's just, I, I think it's just a feeling. I don't know about other artists, but for me, it's a feeling. Once you know it's done, it's done. 
And same way, when you are working, you get stuck. You know you are stuck. It's just an empty head. You know, you just have to walk away and go. And then there is the other part where you have to let them go. But most of the time, I keep it for a while. I don't tell my gallery when a painting is that, oh, my gallery, one of my gallery representatives, I shouldn't have said that. (laughs) 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 What sequels out? (laughs) But yeah, I I like to keep it for a while to see the progression. Because for me, when I complete a painting today, I make sure what I, I do tomorrow is better than what I did yesterday. So it's important for me to keep it a while to see the progression and see what I could have done better or what I should take out. And when it's time to release it, you release it, but you know, once you know it's going in a good home, just like the one you have, it's been with me for a long time. And even though it was very difficult for me to let go, I knew it was coming to a good home. And then me coming to your home and seeing it, it was just amazing. And I didn't know I I haven't even signed it. That is, (laughs) that painting wasn't even signed. Because like I said, I did it to keep it because once I was done with that painting, I had some connection with it. I didn't know why. So I decided to keep it for myself. But again, when you know it's going to a good home and the person will take care of it like you did, you are willing to let go. Yeah, so once the time you go to this thing. So I appreciate it and um, thank you for having me. Can I ask? Um... I just want to piggyback that because there are a lot of artists in the room. Can you talk about the importance of holding back some works and keeping works for yourself? Because a lot of the younger artists, they make it and it goes. They make it and it goes. And then, you know, they end up regretting years from now. Wow, I should have kept that. So why is it important to keep some of the work for yourself beyond what you articulated in terms of learnings? Keep it. It is important, keep it. Um, And I didn't know that myself, because from the beginning I was letting it all go because I wanted to get myself out there. But it is important that you keep a lot for yourself too. Because um, there is this documentary that I watch and um, this artist um, um, had to do a museum show and they had to contact all these collectors and the works was all over. But he had kept a lot of the works. So everything came out from his archives, did the show, and once the show was done, it came back to him. So you are keeping part of yourself and also um, documenting your own history that once you are no more to go away, you have most of the stuff that, um, 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 that has been with you and you know how these artworks are being explored around but it is important to keep keep uh, keep a lot for yourself it's keeping part of yourself and documenting also your process from the beginning it's important to have that and once you have your retrospective you will have the best story to tell yourself and not other things that are outside so keep it Well, thank you, Otis. Uh, anybody else to be here? So, thank you to Larry Nose. Give him a round of applause.